the sanctuary as a result of that. And later on talks about how, because everybody's got motor cars and can get to seaside resorts on Sundays, the church, if it needs to be where people are, should follow. Eliot in this poem is talking about the absence of community, but he's also lamenting another issue here, which is people's increasing mobility. But this is a second factor, I think, for us here. It's not just that people choose between faiths anymore. It's also that having selected a faith, they then, even within that, choose what to believe. Now, because I run a, a theological college, which is uh, effectively, if you like, a, a vicar factory, also known in modern idiom as Holy Hogwarts, because of the way the buildings look. <laughs> uh, I'm very powerfully aware that uh, one of the interesting things that you have to do when you're preparing uh, women and men for ordained ministry is remind them that the congregations they're going to serve will not necessarily agree with their theological views. You do sometimes have to say to vicars and ministers, don't you, that you can never make the assumption that what they believe is what their congregations believe. Because they sit there week by week listening to the sermons, sifting these, taking a mental note of what they like, what they dislike, what they affirm, what they disagree with, what they put to one side, and what they might think about a bit later. Again, another American writer has much to say about this, because uh, Dean Hoag talks about one of the dilemmas that all ministers of whatever faith today face. He says it's not just that people choose between faiths, it's that when they have selected their faith, they then make further choices about what to believe within that faith. In other words, the position of the minister is more relativised than it has been, and the strength and salience of the tradition is more relativised than it has been. How is that so? Well, because if people don't like the sermon or the talk or the homily, they can go home and they can go on the internet and they can find something better, or something that they agree with more, or something that they disagree with more. Or they can check out, if they want, where this fits in with other world views. In other words, their access to knowledge is also consumerist. It also, therefore, empowers individuals to be really aware of where their beliefs lie, and crucially, of course, what they want to believe. Now, what do I think about this as a person of faith, and as a scholar, and as a Christian? Well, I happen to think that one of the biggest challenges today for all faiths in the modern world, exposed as they are, as never before, I think, to consumerism and communication, is what I would call the cleansing of desire. It's perfectly possible to make a faith in your own image. It's perfectly possible to have faith on its own terms. But, I would argue, one of the things that faith calls us to is something a great deal higher. Having said that, faith tends, by and large, to collude with consumerism, often in ways that it can't fully comprehend. It's not terrifically self-aware about this. Let me give you one example about this, uh, just to illustrate this. Uh, my early doctoral research was on evangelicalism and fundamentalism, particularly American styles. And one of the things that really interested me about uh, American Christian fundamentalism was the extraordinary pragmatic and successful way in which it managed to market itself. It was very good at attracting numbers. But the more you look, the more puzzling it becomes, because it's not just pragmatic and culturally um, relevant. It is to an extent right on that line between culturally relevant and culturally relative. So let me give you uh, some examples from designer Bibles. Now, it is a fact that if you go into most American shopping malls of any great size, particularly uh, in the deeper south of the USA, you'll find Christian bookstores nestling in there with perfectly normal secular shopping. 
So I always make it my business when I'm in the USA to find one of these Christian bookshops and just go and note what kind of books they've got. And on my last trip there, uh, last year, um, I just clocked the number of Bibles they had and the number of different varieties. Are you ready for this? Okay. So, these are a sort of what I call a smorgasbord of different Bibles to suit every particular taste for every conceivable Christian consumer. The Men's Devotional Bible, the Mum's Devotional Bible, the Women's Devotional Bible, Daily Study Bible for Women, Daily Study Bible for Men, Women of Faith Study Bible, Catholic Women's Devotional Bible, My Personal Promise Bible for Women, the Extreme Teen Bible, I don't even know what that is, but they have one. <laughs> the Praise and Worship Study Bible. The Spirit-Filled Life Bible. The Life Recovery Bible, that's for people with addictions who are getting better. The Jesus Bible, it's a Jesus thing, exclamation mark. My Book by God. The God Speaks Bible. The X-Rated Bible, which is more towards the teenage of, uh, end of the market. The One Year Chronological Bible, the entire living translation in 365 daily readings in the order the events actually occurred, um, is another version of the Bible. Do you want to know how many I've found? Over a hundred. Over a hundred with titles like that. And of course, what they were doing was filling niche markets. They had different covers, different fields, different tabulations, different styles. And I would just make an observation here that this is a classic example of Christianity and consumerism colluding so that you get a Bible or the scriptures largely on the terms that you want in a way that's relevant to you at a time of your life that particularly suits you. But I have a question, as you could probably detect, about whether that's a good thing or not. Because if everything is related and relevant and on your level, then where's the demand? Where's the obligation? Where's the duty? Where's the higher calling? Where, in effect, is the toughness of faith that really calls things out of ourselves? In case you think this is just a particularly religious problem uh, for Christians, um, I refer you to uh, an article published in The Economist uh, just uh, about six months ago talking about the ways in which consumerism is beginning to impact on global Islam. Now, a really very interesting set of questions around this because, of course, we tend not to speak about Judaism and Islam in these terms. But um, you'll know as well as I do that uh, all faiths are contextual, and all faiths, when they embed themselves in culture, adapt. There are slightly different rules and different understandings about the relations between men and women and how they're conceived of in society. They vary from east to west and from north to south. They vary within the Islamic world, and they vary from outside the Islamic world. But in terms of preaching and practicing, Islam, as you know, rests on five pillars. The Hajj, praying several times a day, attending mosque at least once a week, giving alms annually, and fasting during Ramadan. So, these are uneven pillars, though, when you actually look at observance. For example, in Southeast Europe, 65% of Muslims pray several times a day. But when you go into the Middle East and to North Africa, that figure is nearly 100%, about 95%. 95% in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Southeast Asia, it's nearly 100% again. But in Central Asia, it's 50%. It's just half. And you have to ask yourself, why? What's that about? It can't just be about consumerism and choice. This is also about how culture and religion are formed together. Again, attending mosques at least once a week. Southeast Europe, 8%. Sub-Saharan Sub uh, Africa, 61%. Giving alms, 56% in Southeast Europe, 
but again nearly 100% in Southeast Asia. Fasting, two thirds of the population in Southeast uh, Europe fast during Ramadan, but again the figure is nearly 100% when you get to other parts of the Muslim world. The Hajj, of course, is another issue altogether because that's only around about 9% of the Muslim world altogether. There are, of course, other things that you can do. But it's really intriguing, I think, that when you actually start to look at this relationship between observation, <coughs> duty, um, the idea of things being obliged, and how people adapt their faith locally on the ground, we find, of course, variations of practice, not just in Christianity, but in Islam as well. Now, if you just have a look on the handouts that you've got there before you, you'll see that um, the first couple of questions, uh, the first couple of quotes, deal to some extent with uh, some of the issues that uh, we're facing this evening. I've put a quote here from uh, Niebuhr at the top to talk about humanity and culture, but it's the second of these quotes for the moment that I'm a little bit more interested in, which is from David Lyon's book. Consumerism has become central to the social and cultural life of the technologically advanced societies in the later 20th century. Meaning is sought as a redemptive gospel in consumption and cultural identities are formed through processes of selective consumption. What on earth does that mean? Well, here's another story for you. Now, this uh, was related to me by uh, a very good friend of mine who was, uh, until his untimely death, uh, a very distinguished professor of sociology, and we sometimes used to teach together in Oxford University, and he came out to lunch uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, before he had started lecturing uh, that morning, uh, the following conversation had taken place between two female American postgraduates who sat in the front of his lecture, and as I say, this was before the lecture started, and one turned to the other and said this, you know, I won't do the American accent, you know, she said um, to her friend, you should really try Roman Catholicism. And she said, in reply, what? What do you mean? And she said, well, I think you should really try Roman Catholicism. I think it would really suit you. <laughs> to which this other girl said, gosh, do you know, I, I, I never really thought about that. Why, why do you say that? And her friend said, well, I don't really know. I mean, I just somehow think that Roman Catholicism and you, well, I don't know, I think you might really enjoy it. I think it might add something to your life. I think you might find it enhances you. And her friend said, really? Do you know, I've never thought about that. I might just give it a go. <laughs> so, what have you got in this tiny, tiny little vignette before a lecture begins? <clears throat> Religion is an accessory. Something that might add meaning to your life. Something that you can put on and try. A bit like going into the sort of Mr. Ben changing room of religiosity. This week I'll try Roman Catholicism, see how it goes. Next week, something else. Where will this adventure lead us? How serious is that conversation? Well, it's completely serious. It's completely true. But, for these two people discussing this, religion is not something that's going to turn your life upside down and cause you to be completely transformed and to become, as it were, somebody who's shaped by duty and obligation and by things that are compulsory. It's something that's imported on your terms. Does it add value to your life? Does it enhance what you're doing? And this is what David Lyon is saying in this quote. Consumerism has become central to the social and cultural life of our technologically advanced societies Meaning is sought as a redemptive gospel in consumption. Cultural identities are formed through selective processes of consumption. In other words, this person is able to choose how religion shapes their life and what bits of religion they want that to do. 
And that's why I think we get so many different kinds of Bibles, in effect. In the same way, the uh, next quote down um, is also, I think, therefore, something of a challenge. The work of religious leaders and moralists in the marketplace of culture is immediately entangled in a related but distinguishable enterprise. Rather than remaining aloof, they entered their own inventive contributions into the market. Initially, these were restricted to the market of reading material, a bit like Luther's tracts, but their cultural production diversified. Religious leaders started to compete with the appeal of popular entertainment. By degrees, religion took on the shape of a commodity. I would argue that's been true of Christianity for at least 500 years, and possibly more than that. But the interesting thing again is, of course, that the seeds of partial destruction and decay for religion are contained within that collusion and that identity. It's a complex thing, to be sure. So one of the things I want to suggest to you this evening is that uh, faith leaders need to be incredibly wary, incredibly wary, of how uh, faith and consumerism collide. Because it's not just a problem that's out there. It's not merely a problem, as it were, that religious people observe and walk away from. The issue is alive and kicking within all faith traditions. The idea of the individual, late or post-capitalist individual, being empowered to select the religious beliefs and practices that they engage with, how they do those things, and uh, to feel perfectly okay about that. Graham Ward, uh, just a little bit further down, talks about this momentous growth in consumer culture, the figurations of religion, and uh, talks about, of course, consuming and consumption and consummate. But, as you see from that quote, he's talking in a sense about surrendering to desire and really saying that one of the acute difficulties faith communities face these days is how desire is uh, transcended, how it's uh, sifted, discerned, challenged and changed. And just at the bottom of that first page, a colleague of mine from Oxford in London, Pete Ward, says this. Our competency as a shopper is challenged not so much by the choice of products, events and experiences, but by what they represent, the hopes and dreams, the aspirations and pleasures. The shop is to seek for something beyond ourselves. To reduce this to materialism is to miss the point, or more importantly, it's to miss an opportunity. For this reaching beyond ourselves indicates a spiritual inclination in many of the everyday activities of shopping. Rather than condemn the shopper as materialist, the church should take shopping seriously as a spiritual exercise. I rather like that, really. Um, rather turns things on its head. But it says that actually, as we all do when we go shopping, we go seeking, we go looking. And what Ward is trying to say, slightly tongue-in-cheek in this quote, is that we need to be realistic about some of the drives in religion which are to do with, sheep, uh, with uh, seeking, with feeding, with sating, and understand that these things have become conflated in the modern world between consumerism and faith. Moreover, that this is not an entirely new problem. Well, what does all this mean for people like ourselves, representing Christianity and Islam and faith and perhaps no faith? One of the things I think I'm really struck by is the sense in which, of course, this is not a new problem because we find ourselves, whoever we are, with faith traditions which have much wider cultural import and significance. I'm very well aware, for example, that this evening, if you weren't sitting here, you could be in the middle of Dundee watching the bishop speak at the switching on of the Christmas lights and uh, no doubt tucking into mince pies and watching this glorious a uh, festival of light take place in the city centre. Who owns Christmas, actually? It's a tricky one, isn't it? Because on one level you could say it's a 
explicitly a Christian festival, but it's one that's actually shared by other faiths, but it's also one that's become such a, an important feature of the cultural and consumerist landscape that it's not easy to say where the church's um, uh, sense of ownership begins and ends. Nativity plays, for example, are not censored by churches. They're not written by churches, but they're the feature of most of our schools and a feature, in fact, of many films as well. And when you look at nativity plays, uh, whenever they take place in schools, you'll see how they've been adapted, uh, by and large, very much for modern idiom in all sorts of ways. Certainly the ones I remember taking part in at school, which is a very, very long time ago now, always had a nod to modern times. Christmas is one of those curious festivals in this country which has been the subject of uh, repression uh, under the Puritan Revolution, the English Civil War. There was an attempt by Parliament to ban Christmas um, after the uh, death of Charles I. It wasn't very popular, by the way, I need to say that, but, uh, but there it was. Uh, a Puritan attitude to faith and to Christianity led people inexorably to conclude that uh, Christmas, because it's not mentioned in the New Testament, uh, would therefore have to be uh, somehow excluded. It was part of that extraordinary biblical tradition in the 17th century, which found that if anything wasn't in the uh, Bible, then it was actually to be uh, set aside and, where possible, banned. Uh, lots of examples of that, some of them uh, I think in some senses rather uh, amusing. Uh, Martin Luther, who I mentioned a little earlier, for example, uh, faced some of his more Protestant critics with a question about whether uh, Lutherans could dance. Now, you might think that's a preposterous question to be asking about whether Lutherans could dance. This is not a general comment I should add about whether Germans are very good at dancing. <laughs> that wasn't the, uh, the question Luther faced. I mean, you might have your own views about late hosen and lots of thigh snapping. But the point about the Protestant critics was that when they looked at the New Testament, dancing is nowhere mentioned. And so the Protestant critics argued that if it's not in the New Testament, it's not part of the New Covenant and therefore Christians should not dance. I could introduce you to conservative evangelical Anglicans who steadfastly refuse to clap. They don't clap in worship, they don't clap in praise, and they definitely don't do anything as trivial as give God a round of applause. Why do they not do this? Because clapping is in the Old Testament, but you don't find it mentioned in the New. The argument, therefore, is that clapping is of the Old Covenant. Luther's argument with this, rather in the way that Richard Hooker's argument with this, was that you can't divide culture and faith in that way. And that you have to accept that these things form new alloys, new compounds in society. And that some of the things that people do which actually meet people's desires and needs for entertainment, whatever they may be, are perfectly legitimate, provided they don't get in the way of faith. So Luther was very clear that dancing for Lutherans was okay. Although Anglican